the best graffiti writers are rackers. He's like, everybody you think that is the best, trust me, they're a racker. He's like, there's something that is like the balls it takes to rack, the consistency, the guile. It just, it just crafts you into this fucking ultimate machine for graffiti. So, um, shit, it totally changed my life. I, I went from like, you know, I was working at like a supermarket in Christie's. I quit that shit because I was making like $4.25 an hour. And here I'm making like, you know, like $200 a day, racking $300 a day. And then we got into like Infamil. Infamil, we call it powders. The Infamil milk, it's, it's, it's the stuff you give. It's like um, the powder for breastfeeding. We got into that. That was big. That was big in the Bronx. Really? Huge. I pretty much, I think every writer in New York City did that. And the bumpy we went to was on Burnside, 183rd. Legendary bumpy. Shout out to you guy. You paid my rent for many years. <laughs> Shout you out. Definitely, Bumpy. But um, yeah, the yellow infamil. And my boy Remo, my boy Remo BTB is the first person I seen racking infamil. He, no, no. He, yeah, I saw him. We, we were chilling with him, me and MB40. We were on the 183rd, and they wanted to go smoke weed, and he had no money. So he went inside the supermarket, came out with two fucking cans of fucking Infamil down his leg, two or three of them. Went to the bodega and came out with money, like $20, $20 or something. And I was like, what the fuck? Did you just sell that? And he's like, yeah, I sold that shit. And he's like, my boy Ashley put me on. And then I was like, hmm, I was already racking. So I started racking, and so... Every supermarket had that shit. So every supermarket I was getting, I was filling up my EMS book bag, 12, 17 powders here. And it w I was racking as much as I can carry because I didn't have a car. So 17 powders here, maybe 12, 13 powders in each thing. Go back and sell it. And I still have time. Go do the same thing again downtown. Queens, we loved Queens. It is true. Queens gets the money because I made so much money in Queens. Flushing, especially flushing. Any racker who's listening to this knows about Queens back in the day. It was lovely. That Genevieve's with the two exits. Ah. <laughs> but, um, uh, shit. Um, that changed my whole thing. So I was really more interested in racking and graffiti was like some side shit that I did. It's like martial arts. Kind of like you evolve and you get better. So maybe I started making $50. Maybe I started making $200. And then you eventually, like, like by the time I met Earsnot in 96, 97, 98, we were making definitely lowest a thousand dollars. Earsnow was way more aggressive than me, so he was probably making like two grand, twenty five hundred, three thousand maybe, a day, cash. I thought you were gonna say a week. No, a day, cash, and um, and then we were living that every nice New Year's Eve type of lifestyle, just party and shit like um eat whatever we want, take cabs wherever we want. And um, that's what it was. And it just kept, and the crazy part is, I don't know how we would be broke. I just, it was crazy. Like I would just be broke like the next day. I would have like, there was times Airstein made $2,000 and he would ask, to, ask me to give him money to get on the train the next day. And I'm like, yo, dude, you got a gambling problem? I don't understand. But it was, um, we were just, you know, we were mad young. We were reckless with money. So that's, it's, it's, you know, I guess to answer your question, it's like for me, uh, it took me living in another country and, you know, wanting to change my life. Like when I moved to Japan and I started teaching English and doing stuff, um, you know, I think that's when I, I, I felt like I quit. I, at the time, we got to fast forward a little bit. I was, I was, this, I, already Iraq crew is a full-fledged thing and... We're all chilling together. It's me, Sace, Earsnot, my boy Glace, Sam, Seaman, all those people were just fucking chilling. Fanta, everybody. So um, at that time, A Life came out, and A Life was uh before the sneaker store. There was a there was like you know it had a retail shop, and uh my boy Jess, um. Just TVT um, worked there and kind of like, Jess was like a fucking genius. He like, all the cool graffiti writers were attracted to that spot. And like, Jess wasn't like scared, like we were racking. So we would rack all day, go to A-Life and leave our shit there 
and go back and rack more. So it was kind of like our locker or some shit. And just was just dumb cool. And so that's the first time I saw people like doing Photoshop and using Illustrator. And I was fascinated by it, but like, I'm like, dude, I'm making a thousand dollars a day. I don't got time to be doing this shit. But um, yeah, going to A-Life and then um, hanging out at A-Life with Jess and Rob and I know and Tammy at the time on uh, upstairs. That's when Jess introduced me to this guy named uh, Komoda-san from Japan. He was like a, he was a buyer for A-Life and he had like, he was, he was, he was maybe distributing or carried A-Life in his store. And at the time I had a Japanese girlfriend and, but I didn't know that much about Japan. Like, psh, like not that much. I, I was obsessed with whatever I was doing. And he was like, yo, if you come to Japan, I'll give you a job. And I was like, okay. But I never thought I would go. And then she hit me up and she's like, yo, let's go to Japan. Let's, um, let's go there for the summer. And for me, uh, the big push was when 9-11 happened. When 9-11 happened, so our bumpy, backtrack, me, our bumpy, at the time we were racking like vitamins. Vitamins was huge. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, that was big. Shout out to my boy Noak. But um, we were we were racking vitamins, me and Irsna, and our bumpy was in Wall Street. And sometimes I would bump off, make my thousand dollars or whatever I made that day. Then I'll go to Wall Street, Wall Trade Center, and then eat lunch there. So I was, in, and then my room, my old roommate at the time, Sam, worked at Wall Street also. So I'd be there to hang out with him. So when when um, when 9/11 happened, I actually moved to Queens. I was living in, I just moved to a house in, um, not Astoria, Steinway. Okay. I moved to a house in Steinway, and. Um, Dude, when that shit happened, I was like, yo, that could have been me. I would, I would eat lunch there. I'd be there like at 11 a.m., 10 a.m. sometimes. And I was like, yo, if I would have died, I never went anywhere in my whole life. Nowhere. All I did was fucking rack mad shit into a lot of graffiti. And to be quite honest, like, that Iraq shit is cool now when you pan back. But to be quite honest, we felt like fucking losers. Like, we, I felt like I got to do something with my life. Because, you know... I didn't feel like I was changing anything. Irsnod didn't feel like he was being a legend. Sems was the only person that noticed it. Sems, VGL, Iraq. Sems was like, yo, this is the best time of our lives. You don't understand what's happening. We were like, yo, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Sems was like, yo, you don't understand. We're going through the best moments of our entire lives and you guys don't fuck. I just thought it was some crazy high talk. And Sems was spot on. But we didn't realize it. I just felt like, damn, I need to do something better with my life, right? I was already at that point. This is like, you know, 99, 2000. Sam's knew it. Sam's, he's like, yo, these are the most precious moments of our entire lives and you motherfuckers don't even notice it. And we're like, yo, shut the fuck up. But, um, um, yeah, when 9-11 happened, I was like, yo, I want to go somewhere. And then I, I decided to go to Japan. And when I, I went to Japan, I went to Fukuoka, which is like the third biggest city. I never heard of Fukuoka in my life. And when I got there, I met Komoda-san, and then um, one thing led to another. I was working with them, had an art show. I started teaching English, and I was being paid like $50 an hour to teach English. And I was like, I don't fucking have a degree. This is amazing. So it was like almost better than racking, because I was like making designs for people, and they were giving me like $500 per design and other shit, and it was just like crazy. So when I got to Japan, I felt like, it's like a video game. Like I restarted my life again. And then, but I have all this crazy experience. So when I went to Japan, I wasn't trying to do graffiti. I was trying to like, just make a new life there. And, but like some of those old habits die hard, man. This was a segment from Mike Iraq's interview. The full episode is available on our Patreon. We have episodes from graffiti writers, Dessa, Mike Iraq, Bat, Ola, Cash4, Host18, XSM, Less YKK, Wayne COD, Dual Riss, and Sake. Members also gain access to Z and I speaking on a range of topics from martial arts, conversations with our close friends, graffiti, mental health, and the world as a whole. Members can message us anything they wish to speak on or suggestions for upcoming episodes. Members can also opt to join our product tier. We send out products like silver mops, sticker packs, photo books, prints, and zines to our members every month. Infinite thank you to everybody who supports the show in any way.